This is uh, Apollo Control Houston at 73 hours, 40 minutes into the flight. Our present orbital data at the elapsed time I gave you uh, still carries an ap a perigee of 60.8 nautical miles. That perigee is occurring at 8 degrees north by 89 degrees west. Um, an apogee, an estimated apogee, this would be of uh, 60.4. This would be after our circular circularization. Um, the flight plan at this point is very busy. All three pilots have uh, considerable tasks to do as opposed to the last several days when the when their columns were virtual blanks. For instance, at uh, 73 hours, 40 minutes, right along about now, Frank Borman is a busy uh, doing a platform aligned to a specific to a specific number. Uh, then he's called upon to roll right 180 degrees in a two-second degree pitch down, and so forth. Uh, at the same time, Jim Lovell is uh, uh, doing uh, a number of vectors. He's working with, uh, on the RCS monitors, ensuring the values in the, the tanks there. And then shortly he is to start a rest period in about 10 minutes, a two-hour rest period. And at the same time, Bill Anders is busy with a battery charger. He's, do he's doing an FPS monitor check. And uh, he is to uh, put a program in to acquire the high gain antenna via the manned space flight network at a specific time. All, and all, during all this, he, he will be, uh, the biomedical switch will be on him, so we'll be following his heart action. All in all, a very busy period on board. We are due to uh, reacquire the spacecraft at, uh, in about six minutes at 73 hours 43 minutes 43 minutes into the flight this is houston uh follow eight houston over this is the follow control houston we expect to acquire just momentarily the first call has gone out we have acquired we're reading uh, uh follow eight pressures. houston over and uh, here goes the first call Apollo 8, Houston, over. Apollo 8, Houston, over. Apollo, Apollo 8, Houston, loud and clear on me. Houston, Apollo 8, over. Apollo 8, Houston, loud and clear on me. All right, you're ready to loud and clear and ready for the burn status report. Roger, ready to copy. Apollo 8, this is Houston. Roger. Uh, your burn was on time. 11 seconds. VGX was plus. 
1.2. VGY minus 1.8. VGZ minus 0.2. Delta VC minus 9 or 0.4. Apogee 6.2. Perigee 6.0.8. Over. Follow control here. That circuit's noisier than we can recall in the last two passes, but we have heard the crew member, I think, Borman confirm an apogee of 62 miles, a perigee of 60.8, a virtually perfect uh, second burn, giving us a circular orbit. We'll continue to we'll leave the line open. Apollo control again. Um, apogee on this, the third rev around the moon, will occur at 80 degrees west longitude, 9 degrees 30 minutes north latitude, those are lunar coordinates of course. The perigee on this rev will occur at uh, 9 degrees 29 minutes south uh, latitude and uh, 99 degrees 28 minutes east longitude, that'll be on the back side of the moon. And our numbers now show uh, an apogee of 60.9 versus a perigee of 60.5 compared to 60, 62 mile apogee and a 60.8 mile apogee from the crew. Uh, excellent agreement. should be advised that we are planning a press conference to begin in about 45 minutes in the uh, NSC auditorium, 9.30 Eastern time. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, uh, wait for clearance. This is Houston, Roger. Uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Uh, we're taking the DSE. Thanks, thank you. Uh, can you hold it for about five seconds? For about one minute? Roger, holding. Okay. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, Roger. We're taking a DSC for dump. Apollo Control Houston. We're 52 minutes from loss of signal on this path. And let's look over our um, ECS, our Environmental Control System summary table. The cabin pressure, 
and holding very nicely. Uh, the cabin temperature 77 degrees. I think that's up a few degrees from yesterday. I don't recall exactly. In general, we can expect to see, uh, we should be seeing a slight rise in temperature. This was predicted by the uh, thermal people, uh, a rise particularly in the outside temperature, the outside skin temperature of the spacecraft, a rise of something like 10 to 12 degrees. And this was uh, based on the estimates from the 101, the Apollo 7 flight, and uh, the experience to date in deep space. The point to be made is that it's, uh, the spacecraft is slightly colder as it traverses from uh, Earth to Moon than it is while in orbit about either body. Slightly colder on the outside. The inside remains relative, relatively stable. Uh, a very quiet period and uh, so we'll just take the line down. If something occurs, we'll come back up immediately. At 74 hours, 10 minutes into the flight, this is Apollo Control, Houston. All right, this is Houston, over. Hello, Michael. Yeah, good morning, Frank. We've been tracking you for about 18 minutes now, and we show your orbit 61 by 60 and a half, over. Apollo 8 Houston, your SPS engine looked good on LOI number Apollo 2 burn. Houston here, 74 hours, 12 minutes. And after a long, uh, quiet period there, Mike Collins put in a call, and he is getting some conversation from Frank Borman, be it ever so brief. Let's hear it now, and we'll catch up and go in, into the live situation. Apollo 8 Houston. Uh, Bill, we've got the tape recorder now. We're uh, evaluating the uh, dump. Uh, the data is good, and we're evaluating the voice quality here shortly. Thank you. Apollo 8 Houston, this is Frank Borman. Uh, they've got a couple of jolly updates for you when you're ready to copy. Plus 
three, zero, six, two, seven, minus zero, zero, six, two, five, plus zero, zero, five, seven, seven, one, eight, zero, zero, one, eight, zero, zero, one, not applicable, plus zero, zero, one, eight, eight, three, zero, six, three, niner, two, five, six, three, zero, four, five, two. Are you with me so far, over? Okay, go ahead. Okay, the last number I gave was Delta VC, picking up with the sextant star. Four, zero, two, seven, three, zero, three, niner, six, zero, three, three, down, zero, three, zero, left, one, niner. Are you with me, over? Okay, plus zero eight five eight minus one six five zero zero one two niner six zero three six one niner five one four six Three seven two one. Comments. North set of stars, Sirius and Rigel. Roll one two niner. Pitch one five five. Yaw zero one zero. Ullage two quad. 20 seconds, 20 seconds from quad Bravo and Delta. Horizon on two degree line at time of ignition minus three minutes. Over. Frank, and a map update for Res 3 slash 4 when you're ready. Ready. Res 3 slash 4. LOS 75 01 23. 
Sunrise, 75, 10, 16. Prime Meridian, 75, 17, 16. AOS, 75, 47, 18. Sunset, 76, 23, 11. Remarks, subsolar point, 75, 46, 55. IP1 acquisition, 76, 11, 17. IP2 acquisition, 76, 12, 30. For IP1 and 2, those act times are for shaft and trunnion angles equal zero. Over. Okay, we're ready to start now. Uh, from uh, my left, we have Glenn Lunny, our flight director, uh, Jerry Carr, the capsule communi communicator, Ed Pavelka, flight dynamics officer, and uh, Dr. John Dietrich, uh, a geologist of the science and applications director. Uh, Pavelka's last name is spelled P E or P A V E L K A. Dietrich's last name. D I E T R I C H. John. And we'll start with Glenn here. Okay, uh, before I briefly summarize the uh, ship we've just been on, uh, uh, this is uh, my second conference for the flight. Uh, yesterday was my first one, and I came over here and told you that I was pleased to be over to. Uh, attend my first conference and today I'm even more pleased uh, to be here and tell you what has gone on the last uh, few hours over in the control center and out around the moon as best as we can. Uh, I think I'll go over the shift work uh, kind of lightly. I suspect, that, I suspect that the best way we can get at what, what you might want to hear some more about is to get into the question and answer period and uh, I, hopefully we have them in here to answer them. Oh, Houston. He came on duty last night about 64 hours a lap. Roger, we're uh, checking into uh, uh, precise start and stop time for your TV, and you are yeah. go for the next travel. We already passed the uh, point of the going into the lunar sphere of influence, so we were falling towards the moon uh, and increasing. Uh, 
prior to going around the moon, uh, at about 66 hours, we did a dump on the erasable memory. You recall last night that there was some uh, okay, Frank, that's one of the things we're looking the, uh, at right now. Uh, we have you ending uh, at about 86 uh, hours, and uh, we're looking at extending that a uh, few minutes to include that Terminator view. Over. The exact time. Uh, what appears to be the problem is that the uh, okay, optic, uh, uh, or uh, not, uh, not an unknown reason right at this time, actually, moved off ahead, a little Polly. bit from the null, and then it's the... Uh, then the computer did not know that, and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, since it drives to the stars, assuming that the optic is at zero, uh, it would get uh, the you for long clear. You were cut out about the DSC and again. When we got into discussion about it, Jim Lovell reported the uh, right the pilot that the it had done something similar to that in the previous the day, and uh, he cleared it up by just reflecting the program and proceeding. Now, the reason we did the erasable memory dump was that it's very likely that uh, okay, this sort one. of thing is uh, just an, either an inadvertent or some form of uh, hardware uh, happening that we don't fully understand it, but it can obviously be worked around just by reselection and uh, doing it again. Starting However, we did want to dump the erasable memory in the We've computer to just to make sure that all the numbers in the computer were right and, and that there wasn't something uh, subtle going on with the computer that could cause that to happen. Uh, we did that, and it was okay. We realigned the platform and used it for the uh, mid-course. Uh, we did a couple of realigns on it, so we knew the platform was okay. We have taken a lot of measurements on the uh, gimbal angles and the uh, accelerometers on the platform. Uh, and with the erasable memory, there was no question in our mind that the uh, entire gene end system was in good shape and ready to do the LOI burn. Uh, that was the only area where where we had some activity uh, that we had to solve prior to uh, coming into the uh, lunar orbit insertion. All the other systems have continued to perform uh, yeah, in the excellent fashion that we have been reporting to you in the last couple of days. Uh, at about 67 hours, uh, some two hours prior to the actual lunar orbit burn, we went through what you call, I guess, a rehearsal of the lunar orbit burn, and that we passed up to a, a commander a preliminary set of data for the lunar orbit burn. He went through uh, the attitude maneuver to the burn attitude. He checked the section star, which is uh, uh, just a check that we have as that the burn attitude is correct. He looks in the section, sees the star at the same shaft and trunnion angles that we read up. And he also checked the uh, gimbal motors and the drive to the SPS uh, cell, and he read back the response to that drive, so he knew that he had both control systems uh, which can drive the uh, SPS cell. Uh, we had some more pad data to pass up. The pad data that we passed up there after uh, we passed up the uh, first lunar orbit insertion pad was mostly uh, precautionary data. Right, we copy as you all that, have Bill. seen the flight plan, and as you will hear today, we will keep uh, the pilots updated on uh, information which they could use to do a trans-Earth injection on both the current oh, rev that we're on and uh, Go ahead, Frank. Uh, the subsequent rev. So they will have. For example, right, going for Bill, in the uh, we wanted to make sure that they had both uh, uh, Apollo the eight eight standing by. The transverse injection on the first opportunity after one rev and on the second uh, opportunity. Uh, stand by uh, one, Frank. Uh, we'll look for him. Up, and uh, while we're doing that, uh, up and around for Bill, the uh, DSE voice all, quality uh, on high bit rate go to sleep, is, uh, uh, is very good. Uh, uh, so if he wants to use the DSE in high bit rate, for a limited uh, amount of time uh, uh, to record uh, important things. Uh, we suggest that he do that. We'd like him to uh, wait 20 seconds after turning it on uh, prior to uh, And then the last hour was relatively quiet, actually, in uh, mostly uh, monitoring on the ground Thank you, Bill. and uh, the crew setting up the cockpit to do the burn. The uh, LOS, or loss of signal, uh, to the Earth, Follow the vehicle Houston. went behind the moon, was very close, uh, as near as anyone can tell to the numbers. God, Rose is sitting up in the viewing room, uh, uh, he can hear what you're saying. And we stood by for a while, I wonder if he's ready for uh, what for many of us uh, was a very long time, it seems. Uh, he says thumbs up uh, on B1. The side of the moon and reacquire. 
we did reacquire and uh, uh, very quickly were able to establish that the burn went very well as far as could be monitored on board and it was soon uh, verified by the checking that the orbit was just about exactly what we wanted. Ed Pazelka has these numbers as we discuss them a little later. The one thing that was happening when the pilots came from behind the moon was that the evaporator the primary evaporator, uh, which, as you recall, we Down were using lunar orbit to augment the radiators, uh, okay. was not operating uh, uh, properly. Radiant. What appears to have happened is that the water in the evaporator dried out uh, since Roger, the last right, time we serviced it, which was, was uh, a, uh, a long time ago, actually. Uh, 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 the lunar module pilot blinders reserviced the evaporator and put it back online and it functioned properly. In the meantime, we brought up the second evaporator and it worked uh, just fine uh, while we were reservicing the primary. Those of you who covered Apollo 7 recall that we went through this cycle several times on Apollo 7. Uh, the primary evaporator is now carrying the load along with the primary radiators and the secondary coolant loop system is uh, off. Uh, just to give you a, a, some examples, when we were on the way out to the moon, the temperature out of the radiators was running about 40 degrees. Uh, in lunar orbit, because of the uh, reflected heat from the lunar surface, the Still radiator going. out temperature is running about 60 degrees, 62 degrees. So we do the final 20 degrees of cooling with the evaporator. Uh, and the rest of, that, of the activity during that first pass was primarily looking at the data, uh, getting the dump data from the uh, first burn, uh, taking a look at all the parameters that we can on the SPS engine and confirming back to the crew that everything looks okay, uh, and we gave them a go to go around another rev. Uh, we also talked to them about the filters for the uh, uh, TV pass. Coming up on the second revolution, which was a TV pass and, and which was essentially going uh, when we got acquisition, uh, that pass went normally. Uh, everyone saw the TV, and I guess the best way to uh, proceed on that subject is to wait until we get into questions and answers. Uh, I spent most of my time, I guess, like Frank Borman did. I was more involved with uh, how the systems were working and how the engine had worked, etc. at that time than, uh, than what the pictures looked like or, or some of the description. Uh, also, there was another comment made that was interesting. Uh, I have talked about the fact that the radiators were a little warmer uh, in lunar orbit. Another indication of this is that Jim Lovell reported that the ice appeared to be melting on the center window, the number three window right in the middle of the hatch, uh, which is an indication of the uh, uh, warmer environment that we're in around the moon. We gave a go for the uh, LOI-2 burn based on our analysis of the uh, engine and the performance of the control system, etc. Uh, LOI-2 was uh, read up to the crew, the pad for LOI-2, the burn information, I should say, for the second lunar orbit burn. Uh, we did a couple of housekeeping kind of things. We had to cycle the fans and the cryos to be sure that uh, uh, they were You're in good shape and it, it was not any stratification. Are you still loud and clear, Frank? So that went okay going behind the moon on the second time, I should say the third time behind the moon, the crew did the uh, LOI-2 burn. Uh, I left short the control center shortly after uh, the discussions we had. Oh, hey, Houston, uh, go ahead, Frank, with your message. As we can tell at this time, that burn went completely normally. Okay. The performance of the system, again, are and nominal. Uh, and as far as we can tell, we have a completely ghost safe track. The activity for the rest of the day, uh, in all likelihood, will go pretty much as you see laid out in the flight plan. We have the rigs uh, uh, laid out for photography work, the first couple of rigs, and then uh, five, six, seven, and eight. The rigs will be the work on those rigs will be concentrated on the landmark tracking. Uh, I'm sure we hope that during the flight hours, I'll be on a different men can get a couple hours sleep. Uh, Trans-Earth injection tonight, uh, and I'm sure the next shift that comes over to brief will have some more information on the uh, details of the planned nominal uh, trans-Earth injection tonight. 
uh, a brief statement, I guess, on consumables. Uh, we have slowly been catching up on the RCS uh, residuals, uh, on the RCS consumables. Uh, when we left the control center, we were in very good shape on the RCS. The uh, work that the pilots were doing in lunar orbit, the tracking, etc., seemed to be running about the kind of numbers we expected. So uh, all that bodes well for the status of the RCS in lunar orbit. The status of the consumables, uh, the oxygen and hydrogen consumables, continues to be one of, uh, of a very comfortable posture for us. We can get back to the Earth at the nominal time on uh, one fire tank and both the oxygen and the hydrogen system at this time. One of the two tanks that we have in the uh, 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 I guess that summarizes what, I, what we have. I have uh, Apollo I just 8, uh, Houston, over. Uh, we will probably... Uh, Roger, Frank, we'd like to know about the water chlorination. Have you, uh, when was the last time you chlorinated the water, over? I suggested to John McLeish last night that for those of you who may have a question which I wouldn't, I or whoever else can Roger, we uh, copy an hour and a half ago. Affirmative. Better get to the answer if you're able to fill in the grant or fill in the PIA. A little bit early, uh, uh, so let's see what we can do today. Okay, we're open now for questions. Reference was made to a critter called Pickard, and uh, I'm told that there are a couple of people. All right, uh, 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 use it again. Uh, do we know what uh, level was referring to? Uh, yes, it's the Terra City in uh, the Sea of Fertility uh, that is labeled as is a pair of craters in the Sea of Fertility uh, that are on some maps listed as Messier and Messier A, I believe it is, or it may be A and B, but it's a twin pair of craters. An old name for one of them is Pickering. M E S S I E R, I believe. Uh, I would like to make the following question. Are you considering the positioning of communication satellites around the moon in order to avoid the communications block? while the, uh, a spacecraft is traveling on the far side of the moon? Uh, that concept has been discussed. However, there are no plans to implement uh, a vehicle to accomplish that at this time that, that I know of. I have two questions. One, uh, we got the impression that they had the TV on as they came around from behind uh, on that first transmission. It seemed to bur burst right in on us. And I wondered if that was the case. The other thing was, I wondered uh, what problems had been introduced by the time lag uh, due to the distance. I noticed at one point they had a one, two, three mark, uh, and I wondered what that was and whether you cranked in uh, here the, the time delay that uh, is intrinsic to the distance. Well, I think that, uh, on your first question, I think the TV was on at just about the time of acquisition, and that was all part of uh, locking up the station. Uh, as far as the mark goes, yes, there's some difference in the time just due to the speed of light of uh, uh, transmissions. However, uh, it seems to me that uh, the mark isn't off more than a second or two, and generally we're dealing with something that doesn't have to be any more accurate than that. Plus, uh, I, I kind of, I guess, mentally anticipated some kind of a uh, discontinuity in conversations, but we don't seem to be having that. Maybe Jerry will comment on that, as busy he's been at that lag a little bit uh, between question and response more than when they were near. That's mostly due to thinking, I think, rather than... Uh, we, uh, uh, we have tried to crank in a little delta to take uh, account of the uh, time lag. We're allowing two seconds, and uh, I think uh, one of the marks that you probably heard was a time hack that I gave them about uh, eight minutes from LOS going, into the, going around the corner for the LOI burn. Uh, what I did is I started at 12 and counted, called that 10, and counted down, and 2 was, was marked. 
and by the time he got it, he got he was at uh, zero on his counter. So that's how we did it. Uh, John, what was the atmosphere in the Mission Control Center at the time of uh, LOI? Uh, I heard some faint yelling and uh, whatnot. Uh, you mean at uh, what time of uh, that we acquired? Uh, at the, yeah, at, at that time of acquisition. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would describe it as a sort of a moving drama to me, but I, I'm not sure I can. Yeah, it. From inside, it certainly wasn't a thing. No. I said from uh, from the the motor itself, it certainly wasn't a faint a faint uh, reaction. It was quite a uh, quite a bit of racket, quite a I'm stir. I'm sure it can be described as one of the happiest Christmas Eves uh, just about anybody there had seen. Take our tail, and then we'll get back over this way. Um, Dr. Dietrich, as a geologist, what has interested you most about what the astronauts have done so far in their lunar orbit? Well, they have, uh, first of all, demonstrated their ability to observe from the spacecraft uh, to a degree that I think surprised most of us, because the earlier observations were in an area that we had expected to be somewhat blanked out because of the high sun angle. And uh, the, the uh, demonstrated ability to observe details in these areas, uh, and of course this improves as you approach the Terminator, uh, was most encouraging to those of us that were in the science support area. The uh, ability to observe details at the higher sun angles that were present uh, when the TV came on. Their descriptions were much more graphic, of course, than the picture because the eye responds better than the camera. Uh, Dr. Beter, can you tell us, uh, uh, as you look at the pictures, uh, where the TV started, uh, from latitude and longitude, uh, and uh, where it uh, terminated? At what, in other words, what part of this lunar track did the uh, TV start and finish? The uh, spacecraft was oriented, so they were looking back along the path uh, that they had traveled. So they were looking east All right, Houston, the Houston. spacecraft was traveling generally westward. The spacecraft uh, uh, gave us the first signal. Roger, we have two and a half minutes to LOS, and uh, all systems uh, are looking good. Everything's looking just fine down here, 10 degrees, uh, 115 degrees because it was above the surface. Uh, they were looking back slightly We'll have some more uh, information on the TV uh, on yeah, the next okay. rev. Uh, uh, we don't, we're not planning any big change in the time, just to extend them a little so, bit, uh, I think, uh, closer to the Terminator. 120 degrees or so east with the total cover. Uh, it took me a while to uh, get organized, so I don't know exactly what was going to take two seconds. Roger, we'll do that next time you come around. I would like to uh, pass that question to the flight crew support. Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, as I remember, the first crater we called out was Brand. And uh, that crater is at about uh, 10 south, uh, 125 east. That's right, the craters that we called Baffert and C are out uh, pretty close together <coughs> at about uh, 25 south, 110 east. C is just right uh, right about on those two uh, on that point, and Baffert is a little bit further south. Okay, the track, uh, I quite frankly don't remember. Uh, they went through, they went through the Terminator. Yes, they, right, they didn't get to the Terminator. Uh, they, went right. they went through the Smythe C, so that would put it at around uh, something like 5 south, 75 east. That's just a little bit past uh, Smythe C, right around the, the craters Kastner and Gilbert. 
no. Has has enough time elapsed to get any kind of a determination on the effect of the mass on on orbit? Well, we'll talk about this a little. We'll have to talk about a little more, but uh, uh, they are detectable. Uh, for example, when uh, the vehicle was passing over the. Uh, uh, some of the major areas, like uh, Copernicus, uh, the men in the uh, tracking area look at something that they call residuals, which is just uh, observed measurement minus a theoretical computed measurement, the best one they have at that time, and they could see it uh, a jiggle-like noise in the measurement at that time, uh, as if there were uh, a mass concentration effect on the measurement itself. Or, or I should say the theoretical computed compared to the observed. Uh, I guess I would also say that it, it seems to be, although it's very early to tell, that the accuracy that uh, that we have on the orbit uh, is pretty good, even even with that mass concentration at the moon, about which we do not know too much yet, uh, at least at the altitudes we're flying. So. Uh, I don't know if I've helped any, but uh, you can see that they're there. You don't. Do you feel that you have any effect on future flight uh, landing? Well, I think I think the thing that we ha that we're trying to learn in this flight is to understand exactly what the effect of the uh, lunar gravitational field is at the altitudes we're at, and hopefully, uh, with the data we get from this flight, we'll be able to work back in, work that back in, and minimize, if not make zero, any effect uh, like that. Yes. Physical side of things. Uh, have you had any more uh, tape reports on astronaut conditions? And uh, how did this work fleet cycle get off right up to the point of the LOI? Jim was the only one resting just prior to LOI, wasn't he? LOI 1. Uh, prior to LOI, Jim Lovell and Bill Anders had a, a flight plan allotment of about seven hours. Uh, I don't know how much sleep Jim got, uh, but Bill got probably about four hours at that time. And uh, uh, as near as I can make out, we are close to being back on the flight plan sleep cycle, which in lunar orbit is kind of small. Uh, but we get off of it kind of in the beginning of the flight when. Uh, when we had the need to sleep the night more often. Have you had anything else on the on the condition? On the no, condition? Uh, yeah, you've heard everything that uh, uh, has come down on the condition. They all seem to be feeling uh, genuinely better and genuinely more chipper than they were in the early stages of the flight. Okay, let's take one from behind. Bill Shelton now. Uh, I have a question on the naming of the lunar features again. Could you tell me uh, what criteria were used in selecting these code names, which I understand are not official yet, approximately how many features are so named, and what liberty or what plan does, does the crew have for naming additional features at will during this flight? Well, I guess the first thing we ought to say is that, that the names that had been put there are very unofficial, I guess as unofficial as you can get, and the uh, requirement really was to have some names for uh, some of these un unmarked uh, craters, uh, and they were arbitrary and uh, just a convenient way to call them out. Uh, frankly, I'm glad to stop reading numbers and letters back and forth. I'm glad to hear a name or two. I want to get back to this uh, uh, to this matter of the track during that television pass and see if we're not a little confused here. If I r heard you correctly, you said that the track terminated at about 5,075 east. But we kept hearing from these people about uh, uh, the Sea of Fertility, which is at uh, like about 50 east. We heard Masculine, which is at 30 east, and so forth. Uh, uh, I just want to get sync with you. Are we talking about the same path? Yes, sir, I think we are. Uh, I guess I got into a little too, too much detail there. Now, when we, when we came across the first time, uh, prior to the TV uh, orbit, the second rev, uh, as I remember, the first crater that was named by Jim Lovell was Langrenus. Yes. And 
and uh, then they steamed on off the other side. He talked about the Sea of Fertility, uh, Tarantia. Pardon me, Dr. Ducey, I'm probably messing up the pronunciation. He mentioned the Pyrenees, Gothenburg, and the rest of those in the Sea of Tranquility. That was on the first pass. Then when we came up on the TV pass, oh, remember they came steaming up around the corner, and uh, they had the TV ready to go just as soon as they rounded the corner, and the first one they called out was Brand. Yeah, fine. That, that, uh, that solves my problem. Okay, and then the TV pass terminated at about Gilbert and Kastner in that area, mm -hmm. and then if you'll remember, Jim had a few more remarks to make while the TV set was off, yeah. and I think that's where we started picking up those other latitudes. <laughs> Uh, now I wanted to ask Lynn Lunny a question. Uh, I understood last night that they might make an attempt to duplicate this famous orbiter picture where you had the uh, lunar, uh, the lunar mass in the foreground and the Earth out in the distance. This wasn't done on this pass. Will they try it tonight at 8.30, do you know? I, I don't know, Bill, but I certainly hope so. I'd like to see one of those, too, but I, uh, but I really don't know. Uh, Dr. Dietrich, I'd like to get back to one point, and I know the question has been asked to you, but you didn't answer it uh, fully. What were the most interesting, the most revealing descriptions made by the cosmonauts uh, so far of the lunar surface, as far as you're concerned? Uh, let's put it this way, it has not been a, uh, a quiet morning for observing what they were doing or saying. We've had other things to do, too. Uh, in the descriptions that I caught uh, while moving back and forth around the TV set, uh, I think probably his description of the interior of uh, the large crater, I cannot find the name now. Is it Tarantius? That, uh, where he saw the, the uh, no, La Langrenus, I believe it was. Terracing. Uh, the terracing, the interior terracing. Uh, this we have seen uh, on photographs, it's true, but uh, photographs uh, capture a view from an instantaneous position, whereas he was able to observe much more as the scene moved under him. You can tell much more about the third dimension uh, by seeing a moving scene, and I uh, thought that this one was one of the things. The other thing that uh, impressed me was that he confirmed the uh, arbiter gray color for the moon. Uh, this, we hope, is uh, something that will be rectified uh, in other parts of the moon, but uh, if it's gray, it's gray. What do you mean rectified? Uh, well, he'll find other colors. We have hopes that, uh, that we will have uh, some spots, uh, fresh areas perhaps, that will show different colors. Uh, in addition to having a different albedo, a different shade of gray. Mark Blue. I have two questions. Dr. Dietrich, uh, if, I, if I may. Was the television uh, at all useful scientifically in any way? Yes, I think it is quite useful. Now, if you're questioning this in the sense, do we get as good a resolution uh, on the television pictures as we will on the film pictures? No. Uh, this is not right. Uh, the film pictures will always be better than the television as far as fidelity and, uh, and the, uh, the ability to recapture measurements, which of course is the name of the game. We need to measure things. Uh, I think that they have scientific value very definitely in that we are able to uh, keep track of what is going on. Uh, we're able to monitor their progress in the areas where they have these areas, these uh, television strips, uh, we are able to ourselves get a little bit of an impression of this moving image that I was talking about him saying. Excuse me, I, di I didn't mean from an operational standpoint, I meant from a science standpoint. Uh, I didn't mean from an Well, for uh, some time to come, that's the only way we will see the image moving under us to get an idea of how it changes with changing angles is by having someone else hold the camera. And, okay, and the other question I had was, uh, I, I remember the, uh, one, of the, one of the three mentioned, I think it's the uh, uh, other craters which they named called Borman, Level, and Anders, and I was just wondering whether they were kidding or whether they actually named them, they had codes for themselves up there. 
you don't have any further comments. Very on. definitely. Uh, I beg your pardon? The craters uh, Borman, Anders, and Lovell, I think, are appropriately located uh, right together, three, in a little uh, puppy foot. Uh, they're located, uh, the center of them is located at about uh, 15 south, 105 east. Borman is the biggest crater, Lovell is the next biggest, and Anders is the smallest. <laughs> What's your latest information on the high and low points of the orbit following LOI-1 and LOI-2? Ed? Ed uh, Trudeau. Would you ask again, please? What's your latest information on the high and low points of the orbit following LOI-1 and LOI-2? Okay, the, uh, the elements were 60.6 uh, .6 nautical miles by 60.7 following LOI-2, and at the time that I left, we did not have a complete uh, pass of radar tracking data, and this was uh, a preliminary estimate. Uh, further question on the SPS, uh, why did it burn longer than expected uh, on both burns? Well, w we actually uh, are not surprised if the burn runs a percent longer. Uh, which is apparently about the kind of number we ran on the first burn, and uh, just a slight change in the chamber pressure can account for that. So that, that's not surprising when you figure that. What about the second? Nine to 11 seconds is really more than a percent. Yes, the, but uh, that number has to be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt because uh, that burn comes on and goes off so fast that uh, I'm sure 10 seconds looks like nine to them, so a th 10 looks like 11, so I, I, I wouldn't, uh, uh, draw any conclusions from that. The significant thing is that the uh, uh, numbers, the velocity numbers left over in the guidance computer were very, very small, which indicated that we hit exactly the conditions that we had targeted for. Uh, the pressures in the engine, etc., are more indicative that the uh, engine is working properly. That's right. Uh, have you been able to tell from their descriptions and or from the TV how far north of their track and how far south of their track they can see? What's the band that they can observe? I, I can see you that one, I believe. Uh, they have about uh, 40 degrees, lunar degrees total, uh, from horizon to horizon. Uh, if the spacecraft happens to be right over the equator, this of course would mean 20 north and 20 south. Uh, due to the inclination of the orbit, uh, at times they are able to see slightly more than 30 degrees south of the equator, and one half revolution later they will see a little more than 30 degrees north of the equator, each time at the expense of the other view. Um, then how much of the, uh, how wide of, what's the farthest north that they will have seen and the farthest south by the time they've made all ten runs? They will, how much of the moon will they have surveyed in effect? How big a band? They will have had the opportunity, now we're speaking of a level moon, not mountain peaks, but on a, on a level surface they would have seen to about uh, 30, Two and a half degrees, I believe. Wasn't it twelve and a half that the uh, that the orbit inclination got to? Uh, it would be about thirty-two and a half degrees to the south, which will generally be on the eastern side of the moon, and then in the on the western side of the moon, they will be to about thirty-two and a half degrees north. peaks will show up beyond that distance. I have a couple of questions. Did I understand you to, did I understand someone to say this morning that the mass cons have had no effect whatsoever on the orbit, or is this uncertain yet? Oh, no, no. Uh, they've affected the orbit, uh, and I just gave some uh, remarks as to how that shows up in a qualitative way. Uh, what exactly they did to the orbit, I, I don't have those numbers with me. You don't know the deviation. No. Uh, the crater naming, was that all done here before the flight, or have they named any craters as they passed over them? 
No, no I, I think the intent of the names that were selected were just to give some uh, identification for training and for making up the many maps that the men have to carry. Uh, that was all done here. I, yes. I assume it was here. Some, uh, there were two named uh, in orbit. There were two names in orbit? Which were the names given in orbit? Oh, the one Aaron and another Pardon one Dennis. Me? Aaron and Dennis. Would you repeat Aaron? A-A-R-O-N and Dennis. Would you explain those again, please? It's just that uh, we pointed those two craters out so on the screen. I remember pointing both of them out and saying, what's the name of that one going by now? And he, Bill said, oh, I don't know. Call it John Aaron. Uh, that's essentially the way we set up the whole designation system of our craters. Uh, there certainly can be no official number, right. name, or letter designated by us. But we had to use a number or some sort of designation for our craters we were going to use that are unnamed. What is the, would someone explain just exactly what landmark tracking is and why it's done? Landmark tracking is simply uh, an operation with the uh, telescope section equipment on board, uh, similar to what was done in Apollo 7, only it is done over the uh, selected areas that we intend to use as uh, uh, eventual landing sites when we go to the moon. Now the intent of the exercise is to see how well the men can, can do that work and how accurately they can then determine where the site is relative to the orbit they're in. Uh, uh, the problem, of course, when you, when you go on a lunar landing mission is to be sure that when you start your descent, you're going down to the site you want to land at. Okay, let's take Henry Simmons and, and go to this gentleman on the third That's row problem. who's, uh, I think, been waiting for a while. On the uh, LOI-2 burn, uh, <coughs> I was interested that the engine had burned about 10 or 20 percent longer than the uh, planned value and yet uh, had produced the uh, requisite delta V change. But does, does that mean the engine is getting weaker? No, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I think that <coughs> just has to do with how accurately the, the time of the burn itself was noted. The, the job that the pilots have when they're doing a burn and monitoring one is uh, fairly extensive and it's pretty intensive also as you could expect and, and, uh, and I think when the burn is over they glance up at the clock and, uh, and note what time it was but uh, to the nearest second or so I wouldn't try to draw any conclusions from that reading. This gentleman on the third row here. During the TV pass uh, if we can assume at any one point that the camera was pointed almost directly down, how large is the area we were seeing? Mark down. I don't know. I, I don't know the uh, lens characteristics well enough to give an answer to your specific question. Uh, at the time they were looking at Smythe C, however, they were seeing, and of course this was not straight down. Uh, this was probably a few degrees to several degrees off vertical. Uh, they were looking at an area uh, that's about 15 lunar degrees in wedge. And, uh, so 16 miles a degree? 16 miles per degree, I believe it is. Nautical miles? Uh, close enough. Uh, at, I think it's 30 kilometers. 30 kilometers a degree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, With reference to the to the previous question about landmark tracking, it sounded rather, as they were coming in, it sounded rather like they had done their homework uh, pretty well because I recall they were calling off uh, their their primary sites and secondary sites, and they were just naming off existing and known landmarks with a, with a great deal of aplomb. I wonder if somebody could comment on this. It seems yeah. to me that the landmark tracking is almost superfluous here. I know it is. No, 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 no. Uh, first off, I think uh, it's great that they can call them off like that as they have to do the star fields and the navigation uh, uh, on the way to the moon. but. The problem with the landmark tracking is mostly a matter of degree and accuracy, and that's what you're trying to get with the tracking itself as opposed to identification. 
Let's take a question from a gentleman at the third row, and then I understand we have a couple of questions at the Cape. Uh, we'll switch there and then come back and wrap it up with a few more questions here. Uh, Dr. Dietrich, you mentioned that you were pleased with their ability to observe detail at high sun angles. I wonder if this could do anything to, uh, in future missions, to give you a wider launch window by perhaps lessening the lunar lighting constraint. Yeah. Uh, that's a decision that someone else will have to make. Uh, the real nice thing about low sun angles is the fact that you can uh, have a better judge of your uh, height of objects that you're looking at. Uh, we had uh, somewhat uh, believed before this morning, before I saw the TV this morning, that there would be a large area that was essentially washed out where you could see very little detail. And that was the thing I was talking about. We still have a degraded vision or a degraded ability to observe details at the high sun angle, but it's not as bad as we had thought. Okay, let's switch uh, to the Cape for a couple of questions. Thanks, John. We've got two questions here. Pete Rice, Chicago's American gentleman. Uh, gentlemen, do we have any idea of the emotional response of the astronauts to this fantastic adventure, becoming the first men to see the moon from close up? Uh, the question was, uh, do we have a feeling for the emotional response they had? I would certainly say it was one of jubilation, exaltation, and uh, any other word I can think of that would be synonymous with those. Uh, this is something they've worked uh, uh, many, many weeks and months on. Uh, one of the questions over here was how much homework had we done on landmark tracking and on our uh, lunar landmarks. And uh, let me assure you, there was a great deal of time put in on this, and I think part of the exaltation was just being able to see something and recognize it. And uh, the more craters they saw and recognized, the more jubilant they became. Uh, Hans Hofer, German press agency. Do you expect the astronauts to see soft planets on the moon's surface? And if you do, which rev would offer the best opportunities for this? I think the question was whether whether we would be able to see the spacecraft on the moon's surface from the Earth. Is that right? I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm not really prepared to answer that as far as... Uh, from the Earth in general goes, uh, the lighting is essentially the same each rev when it comes around. I, I guess the only hope for seeing it would be that uh, uh, while the spacecraft would still be in sunlight, the moon below would be dark, and you would see a reflection of the uh, uh, spacecraft, some sun off the spacecraft against the uh, uh, dark background of the moon when it was in shade. I have heard that some people are trying to actually catch that with the telescope, but uh, I can't comment on it any more than that. Uh, thanks very much, but sorry, uh, this was not what I had in mind. Do you expect the crew, the crew of Apollo 8, to see soft landers on the surface of the moon? I mean, uh, the Weyers, Rangers, and so on. And if you do, uh, in which revolution would you expect them to do it? Oh. 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 Oh, I don't know. Uh, there is one surveyor craft that is just a few degrees on the dark side of the Terminator. This was our closest chance, and had the launch slipped a few days, we might have had an opportunity. As it is now, the uh, spacecraft are on the dark side of the Terminator, and the answer is no. There's no chance. Okay. Visibility of objects on the dark side of the Terminator. Have they said anything about visibility? How dark it actually is? They haven't said anything that I know of, Jerry, but I imagine it's pretty dark. Uh, the only comment that I have heard along that line was while they were still over the sunlit surface, looking beyond the Terminator, uh, I believe it was on the first revolution, there was a comment that we could not see in objects in earth shine. But when they're stand, or flying above the glaring surface, uh, I wouldn't expect them to have their night adaptation yet. So hopefully, but I haven't heard any words. Very pleased. 
couple more questions on nomenclature. Uh, we've had John Aaron identified for us, but would you tell us who Mr. Dennis is and why he was cited in flight? <laughs> John, John Aaron is uh, one of the men who works over in the control center in the Moker. He's worked a lot of Gemini flights, <laughs> and he's worked almost all the Apollo flights, and he's real popular with uh, all the pilots for his work. Uh, Dennis uh, is a, a young gentleman who works over uh, in our neck of the woods in Flight Crew Systems uh, Division. Uh, he was uh, one of the uh, real mainstays in the formulation of the checklist. And, uh, so uh, the crew has, had naturally had quite a bit of contact with him, and uh, when they needed a name quick to name one, the first one they thought of was Dennis. Well, is that his first name? That's his first name, Dennis <laughs> Bentley. His last name is Bentley. B E A T L E Y. Right. <laughs> no, the What's the latitude uh, longitude of Bentley? <laughs> uh, this, this is <laughs> uh, what I what I did want to ask was after the Russians got their first backside pictures, they named a bunch of blobs over there for people on their side of the world. And I think the IAU did ultimately accept those as official names. Now, do you have any intention to propose these uh, to the International Astronomical Union as official names? You know, yeah. I have no idea. I don't think there was any intent uh, in the designation of these craters to formally propose these as names because uh, uh, we just didn't feel there was a chance anyway. We only we only gave them these names because we wanted to in some small way uh, give recognition to those who uh, were really close to our Apollo 8 mission. Yes, uh, Dr. Jesus, uh, when were the, uh, the names uh, Borman, Lovell, Ander, Anders, uh, Bassett, and C proposed, or, or when did they come up? Uh, several months ago or just recently? Uh, as far as, as my experience is concerned, I first saw them on a map about three days ago. I saw them this morning when they handed me the map at the Capcom console. Well, did you do it, sir? No, sir. Who, oh, who did? Flight, flight crew support group. The uh, crew did it. The, the, uh, crew. the crew did it. The, the problem is, when you're trying to describe something, <coughs> uh, you need a handle. And the backside of the moon is almost without handles to hold on to. But so they had to have something. But these were on the front side. These were on the front side, weren't they? No, sir. They're all, I believe every one of the named craters is beyond 90 degrees east. That's right. Or if not, it's very near 90 where we're looking at it flat on when we're looking at it with an Earth telescope so that you can see very little about the surface. The Collins and Houston are about 92 and 95 respectively. They have class. Uh, question for Dr. Dietrich. There was a reference, I think, by Lovell to craters with dark spots in the centers and with light, what looked like light dust around the rim. Uh, could you uh, draw any conclusions from that, or did it sound like what you've seen before in photographs? Did it add anything, or uh, uh, raise your uh, interest at all? It raised my interest, uh, particularly because uh, there is a, uh, a very small amount of normal dark-colored Mari material on the uh, part of the moon that we have recently found out about from orbiter photographs, the back side far side of it. Uh, he may have been referring, and I do not know for sure, he may have been referring to craters with dark floors uh, of material something like this Mari deposit, but with lighter colored rim. This would be in line with, well, for instance, Copernicus on the front side uh, is a very large crater with similar characteristics. I don't know the craters he was talking about. Arch Natty. On the matter of the nomenclature again, isn't it the tradition of the IAU to name these objects after people who are deceased, and would this be a violation of that tradition? I don't know the uh, total rule list. I know that uh, about a year and a half ago there was some discussion, and at that time one of the conditions was that if it was a person, 
the person would be deceased, but I do not know whether this is one of the rules. Mark Bloom. John, I just want to ask John, uh, so we can all write our sidebars, is it possible we could get that map that uh, Mr. Carr was referring to with the names on it, so we'll know where all these things are? Well, let's see, at uh, this point in time, I think we've only got a single copy, uh, the one that Gary's got, but why don't we look into the possibilities of uh, reproduction? It's, it's right. certainly available for perusal, I know. Because, uh, because it, it, it seems to be a point of interest, and, and it's going to get very confused, I think, if we don't get at least a good map like that. We'll check into it right after the conference. Uh, let's see, we've got time for about three or four more questions. John, there are a number of numbers that we would like to get cleared up, and I think it's probably simpler if, you, if we could have you read some of them than if we all come up and try to do it individually, such okay. as exact times on LOI 1 and 2, Delta Vs on LOI 1 and 2, and so on. Do we have a, yeah, are those available? Uh, I believe uh, that's one of our prime purposes uh, for Mr. Flavel to go with us today. Uh, why don't we close it on that note, if you like? Okay, I can begin by giving you the uh, ignition time for the LOI-1 maneuver. It was 69 hours, 08 minutes, 19.5 seconds. The delta V of that maneuver was 2,996.8 feet per second. Uh, let me give you those, those parameters on the LOI-2 maneuver, and I'd, I'd be happy if you would uh, point me in the direction of other uh, parameters that you're interested in. For LOI-2, the ignition time was 73 hours, 35 minutes, 05.7 seconds. The delta V for that maneuver was 135.2 feet per second. Uh, those are the, generally the main points of interest. Uh, if you'll give me some questions, I'll see you. First LOS and the first AOS. Did you get that? The first LOS was 68 hours, 58 minutes, 05 seconds. The first acquisition was 69 hours, 31 minutes, 45 seconds. The first acquisition, 69 hours, 31 minutes, 45 seconds. Just one other one. <laughs> Is, do you have a period for the new orbit so that we can uh, estimate about what their orbital time is each time? Well, we're getting there. It's very close to two hours. If that helps any. Do you have an exact number? Yeah, the burn is two. I think you hit the magic number. That, uh, that I don't have in my pocket here. Two hours is the number we use as a rule of thumb. It's very close. It's within several minutes. Okay, that burn. Could you have the duration of the two burns? <coughs> okay. The uh, burn time for the LOI-1 burn was 4 minutes, 02.36 seconds. The burn time for LOI-2 was 9.34 seconds. One more for history, if I may. It got a little confused at this point. Does anyone have the exact first words from lunar orbit and who said them? Why don't you take that, Gary? Uh, as I remember, the first words uh, on acquisition came from Jim Lovell. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact words, but I know that it, uh, it uh, involved the, what we call the burn status report. The first item on the burn status report is uh, uh, whether the ignition went off on time. And as I remember, the very next thing he said was uh, what is what the Parasynthian and Apocynthian were. And I believe, did you write those down, Glenn? He uh, called them out as yeah. Uh, he called out about 61 and 169. Yeah, they were so close that everybody just gasped. They were so close to being right smack on the button. Okay, on that historic note, let's close it.
This is Apollo Control Houston, 75 hours, 37 minutes into the flight. Before we lost signal with the spacecraft, uh, oh, some half hour ago, I suppose, 20 minutes ago, Frank Borman came up on the line and said he would like to uh, dedicate a prayer to the people of St. John's Church, his church here in Seabrook, and he added to all the people of the world. Here is that prayer. Apollo 8 Houston, uh, go ahead, Frank, with your message. Okay, this is Gerard Rose and the people of St. Christopher, actually the people everywhere. Give us, O oh God, the vision which can see thy love in the world in spite of human failure. Give us the faith to trust the goodness in spite of our ignorance and weakness. Give us the knowledge that we may continue to pray with understanding hearts. And show us what each one of us can do to set forward the coming of the day of universal peace. Amen. Amen. I was supposed to lay read tonight, and I, I, just, I couldn't quite make it. All right, Judge. I think they understand. This is Apollo Control. That was Frank Borman reading a prayer. Uh, he mentioned the name to Rod Rose and to the people of St. John's. Rod Rose is an assistant to uh, Chris Kraft and the flight operations directorate. He is a member of the same church. And uh, we'll see to it that St. John's receives a high fidelity quality copy of that tape uh, for uh, an evening service tonight, which uh, Frank Borman regrets that he could not make. There is, uh, there was other conversation, primarily updates on uh, contingency type events. That those events and uh, that tape will be passed directly to the transcriptionist and to the pool. At uh, 75 hours 39 minutes into the flight, this is Apollo Control. We're about eight minutes from acquisition on our uh, upcoming rev across the face of the moon. This is Apollo Control, Houston.